Hi, and welcome to the Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian. My name is Jonathan Messenger. And my name is Bebop, Robobogo, Wanatron, and together we make up the Jonatrons. Wait, we're the what now? We're the Jonatrons. <laughs> what are the Jonatrons? It's our band. Come on, you know that. We have a band? I didn't know we had a band. Yeah, totally. I know you're into this whole podcast thing, but music is really where my heart lies. Was that one of our songs? It could be. Okay, I don't remember signing up for this, Bebop. Look, you don't really have to do anything. I will sing and write all the songs and sign all the autographs and do all the press interviews. Okay. And then all you have to do is play guitar, bass, drums, trumpet, the accordion, or as I like to call it, the old squeeze box, triangle, violin, oboe, nobo, and flugelhorn. Did you say I play the nobo? I can't wait until our debut album comes out. All right, well, (laughs) I think this is a bad sign of things to come. But while you're working on that, Bebop, I'll keep working on the podcast, okay? And if you remember what happened in our last episode... The cosmonauts aboard the Marlowe found a sort of floating object in the middle of their library. And when we left off, Abigail's brand new robot, Megbot, was about to address the rest of the crew. So we're going to go back a little bit to learn a little bit more about Meg in the Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian, Season 3, Episode 2, A Wrinkle of Mine. When Abigail downloaded her book into her robot, she didn't know what its name was going to be. Just like when Finn ran around the world in 80 days through Foggy's mainframe, he had no idea it would be Phileas Fogg who would lend his personality to his robot. Of course, Finn had tossed whatever book was flying at him while he fell through the library stacks, so the surprise was more surprising. Still, when a kid on the Marlowe chose his or her book, to download onto a robot, there was always a risk their favorite character wouldn't show up. The robot algorithm was smart enough by the time Abigail and Finn came around that it wasn't making big mistakes anymore. You couldn't put in the two towers and walk out with a robot that grunted like an orc, for instance. At least, not anymore. Poor Protofessor had more than a few villains clanking around in his head, though. These days, the robot knows to search for names in the book that come up often, particularly at the beginnings of chapters when a hero's name is typically mentioned. But the software isn't foolproof, and you can't simply order up a personality for a robot like it was fast food. So when Abigail selected a classic children's book and perhaps the high watermark for science fiction for kids, she couldn't be sure whose personality would rise to the surface. On her birthday, Abigail and Finn ran out of the library and hurried back to the Great Hall, Abigail shielding the title of the book from Finn. Come on, said Finn. Show me what it is. You didn't show me when it was your turn, said Abigail. Yeah, but that's because there were three giant wild things chasing us at the time. Abigail dashed into the Great Hall and slid the book into the back of the robot, which immediately sprang to life. It began whirring as it processed the text. Its eyes lit up, and everyone in the hall remained silent as the robot said, Robot number 485, now downloading A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lengel. A murmur rushed around the hall. Every adult on the Marlowe had read A Wrinkle in Time when they were younger. Finn, Elias, and Vale all looked at each other, None of them had read it yet, but they had seen Abigail carrying it around earlier in the year. I should have guessed, Finn said, nudging Abigail, who was standing, smiling at her new robot. It clanged and beeped and hooped, and then finally, it stopped. Its eyes turned to Abigail, and it seemed to smile. Hi, said the robot. 
The adults were all stunned. The robot's protocol commanded that it say its name, announce itself, give its new friend some sense of who it was, but the robot just said, Hi! Abigail was so proud she thought nothing of it, but the engineers all began to look worried. Hi, I'm Abigail, she said. I know, said the robot. And I am your robot. Abigail laughed as the adults in the room seemed to grow more concerned. Elias ran over to where his parents were, and they all huddled together, discussing what they were seeing. Don't you have a name? said Abigail. I have many names. What would you like to call me? Abigail thought about it for a moment. She stared into her robot's eyes and wondered which character from A Wrinkle in Time was staring back at her. But finally, she went with her gut. When she'd chosen the book, she'd hoped the robot would take on the personality of Meg, the hero, the girl whose strong will makes her life hard on Earth, but makes her a hero in space. I I think I'll call you Megbot, said Abigail, or Meg for short. That is a great name, said the robot. I would be proud to be Megbot. Abigail smiled and hugged her new robot, and the adults all seemed to relax a little. This one may not have been behaving to the script, but Abigail was happy and the robot seemed to return her affection. That night, Abigail and Meg, Finn and Foggy, walked around the Marlow so Meg could get the lay of the land. They showed her the library, the robot engineering room where she had been built, the explorer pods and every nook and cranny they could think of, and they introduced Meg to anyone they came across. Though each time, Meg never said more than, Hi! and smiled. You will love it here, Foggy told Megbot. It has everything you could possibly want, and if anything ever goes wrong, there are engineers who can fix you in no time. Voltronics is younger than I am, and he's already had 15 repairs. Good day, good winds, and much more fluency, said Protofessor, who had just turned into the hallway. Not now, Proto, said Finn. He worried that Meg seemed a little different and confused, and he didn't want Meg to see that there was a robot as confused as Protofessor was on her first day. Sorry, Meg, this is Protofessor. He was our first robot here, and he kind of has some trouble keeping things straight. Although sometimes he seems to be giving us a message, said Abigail. Life is to be lived. The clocks strike 13, said Protofessor. The only people for me are the mad ones, said Meg. The protofessor shook and seemed to nearly burst. He was so pleased with Meg's response. He spun twice, crashed into a wall, and then continued off down the hallway. Wow, said Elias. You really connected with protofessor. I've never seen anyone do that before. That's because she's special, said Abigail, looping an arm around Meg. Actually, she is special. Quite. It was Elias's father, the robot engineer. I wonder, Meg, would you mind coming to the robot room with us? Just for a few tests. No, said Abigail. I mean, please, no, Mr. Carreras. I just got her. Can't these tests wait? Elias's dad didn't look pleased, but he nodded and let the kids continue on. Okay, Abigail, but I would like to take a look at Meg, and soon. Meg, if you feel anything strange or wrong, you come let me know right away. Meg nodded, and for the rest of the day, she said very little beyond greeting new people and robots and barking a bit at Robocloco, who was surprised by her behavior. I can speak too, you know. You don't have to bark at me. Everyone but Abigail was growing increasingly worried about Meg. While Foggy was a little unpredictable and Voltronics wasn't the brightest star in the sky, Meg was a different creature altogether. And that's why Finn brought Meg in with Foggy and Cloco to create Abigail's space skating routine. 
Abigail and her parents were having dinner privately, a birthday tradition for her family. So Finn, Foggy, Cloco, and Meg met in the simulation room. Foggy had programmed it to mirror the vast space outside, and walking into the room made Finn feel a little dizzy, like he was adrift and surrounded by stars. Foggy and Cloco immediately began to come up with their moves, spinning and poking and doing something they thought looked like dancing. Finn watched Meg watch her fellow robots, and he could see her, soaking it all in, enjoying the process. Do you like it here so far, Meg? Finn asked. She looked at Finn and nodded, and then stood and strode to the middle of the room. Without saying a word, she swept up to the top of the dome and looped back down to the floor. (laughs) Wow, nice flying, said Foggy. And the three robots began dancing in the room, figuring out their routines. Could I try this? Meg said, and sparks and fireworks shot out of her hands. She surprised everyone. Foggy dove away from them, and Finn covered his head. Cloco's canine instincts kicked in, and he started barking. (laughs) Cloco, Cloco, (laughs) it's okay, said Finn. I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me, said Cloco, embarrassed by his wild side. What's that smell, said Finn. That would be your burning hair, my friend, said Foggy patting out the small flame on Finn's scalp. There you are. No harm done. I'm sorry, said Meg. I didn't know you didn't know about that. I won't do it again. Oh, no, said Foggy. You should definitely do that in the show when we're outside. But how do you do that anyway? By tapping into the energy of the universe. No one said anything. Is this not normal? said Meg. Eh, what's normal? said Robocloco. He's a kid astronaut, you two are book bots, and I'm a talking dog. Meg seemed satisfied with this answer, and they returned to their practice. Finn, Foggy, and Cloco, though, knew there was something strange, something strange and magnificent about Meg. And so that mystery hung around Meg as she approached the floating stone in the library. Finn wasn't sure if everyone felt it, but when Meg let go of Abigail's hand and Finn's mother said, well, it looks like Meg has something she wants to say, Finn felt the air in the library grow cold. Meg put her hand on the stone. Careful, said Abigail. The stone began to hum and seemed to be vibrating under Meg's touch. I do not mean to alarm you, said Meg, but there is something, something I know, and I don't know how I know it, but I do. I can see it, out there, and it is a force that none of you have experienced before. I'm not sure you all will know it. It's unlike anything you've seen on your home planet or in your travels. What is she talking about? Vale whispered to Elias. The stone began to vibrate even more. Elias put his fingers to his lips. He wanted to hear what Meg had to say. Isn't it obviously some sort of alien egg? Said Vale. This is no egg, said Meg, not looking at Vale. There is a darkness ahead, a darkness approaching, and it will be up to you, all of you, but especially you, Abigail, Finn, Elias, and Vale. You will need to be strong to stop this darkness from getting closer. This, this thing, this is a warning from the darkness. It is an orb of dark energy, a small slice of what awaits you out there. It floats because it has no weight, but it carries much weight with it. The stone's hum grew louder. It hums as it readies to release its energy. The stone grew even louder, vibrating so fast it seemed to blur. We must find a way to remove it, quickly, before the darkness spreads throughout the Marlow. Cracks formed along the stone. Oh no. The cracks widened. We may be too late. The stone split around the edge. The dark energy, it shall be released. 
then a little blue baby leg poked out of the stone. Oh. I guess it is an egg. Yes! said Vale. All right, I am here with my editor and son, Griffin Messenger. Say hi to everybody, Griff. Hey, hey, hello. All right, Griff, what do you think of that episode? Pretty good. <laughs> okay, and do you have any questions about it? Uh, I wonder if that little furry leg, whoever that belongs to, is, is the darkness. Okay, well, let's, let's dial back for a second. <laughs> so the book that Meg came from is called... A Wrinkle in Time, which I said like 3,000 times. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I actually had a listener write in and say, because I took out the parts where you said it last time, but there was one part where if you really listen closely, you could hear it. A listener wrote in and said, I heard Griffin give it away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one of the times I whispered it. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, and in The Wrinkle in Time, there's this kind of ominous force out there the, in the universe. The thing. There's the thing, and then there's the darkness. Remember the the kind of like dark cloud? Oh, yeah. So, but we did really like that book a lot. And so a lot of this season is going to be exploring themes of that book. And actually, I think the book is being made into a movie now. So uh, that's kind of cool, too. Yeah. Because it's, it's a good book. You should check it out at the library or look at it for for an old, at an old bookstore or something. Yeah, right, exactly. So, all right, so your question was, you wonder if the little baby, the, the leg popped out, is is the darkness. Yeah, the little baby's the darkness. Well, it seems like that's what Meg thinks, right? Yeah, although she thought the egg was the, the egg was the darkness, and it was like, oh, no. and then like, no, for legs popped out, and she was like, oh, I guess it's an egg. Yeah, right. I wonder what the big bad guy of this season is going to be. Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. You know, one thing, Meg is a lot different than the other robots so far, right? Yeah. She, she At first, she didn't even say her name. Yeah. So I think that's going to be kind of a fun thing this season to see what's up with Meg. Yeah. And like if she's functioning properly. and. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and it's interesting that you brought up whether she's functioning properly, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of times something can function differently and you wonder if it's functioning properly, but it's, it's totally fine. It's just a little different, right? Mm -hmm. That's like goes with machines or people or anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But they were at first a little worried about Meg. Yeah. Right. Right. All right. Well, do you have any other questions or thoughts? Hmm. Not really. Okay. Do you know what time it is then? Art time, art time, art time, art time. <laughs> All right. Let's do some art. Okay. This week we have to thank chefs Lucy Herzog, who's six years old, Cadence, who's seven from Ventura, California, Henry, who's seven from Houston, Texas, Ari, who's seven from Dawsonville, Georgia, Valentino and Sebastian from Redwood Shores, California, Aldo, who's six from Portland, Oregon, Ben from Thomasville, Georgia, Benjamin and Jaden, two brothers, Avonlea and Corin from Edmonds, Washington, Siri, who's six, and Greta, who's four, from Chicago, Illinois, Grant, who's six and a half, from Minneapolis, Sabrina, who's five, Tal, who's eight, and Emery, who's six, from College Station, Texas, Lila, who's nine, and Theo, who's three, from Hawaii, our friend Wyatt, Evie, who's eight, from Dayton, Ohio, Eli, who's five, from Minneapolis, Otto, who's nine, and Juniper, who's seven, from St. Paul, Minnesota. Grayson, who's five, from Switzerland. Riley Ann, who is seven, from my old stomping grounds of Wenham, Massachusetts. Elliot, who's seven, from Shoreline, Washington. Elliot, who's six, from Seattle, Washington. And Zoe, who's nine, from Tennessee. And then our pal Mauricio, who sent in a whole lot of art. And that's all the chefs for this week. If you have sent in your art and you haven't heard your name yet, you will, I promise. And now, do you know what time it is? Jokey, jokey, jokey jokes. <laughs> that's right. It's jokey, jokey, jokey jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, so just a couple of jokes today. The first one is from Adair, who lives in New Dundee, Ontario, Canada, who's five years old. And he asked, why did the alien cross the spaceship? 
because it wanted a piece of space pie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great reason to cross a spaceship. Okay, and then our final joke for today is from Austin, who's seven years old, and here he goes. Hello, my name is Austin. I live in Washington State. My joke is, what do you call the Hardy Boys when they're late for school? What? The Tardy Boys. <laughs> <laughs> that is my kind of joke. Thank you so much, Austin. I really appreciate that. Thanks to both of our comedians, and thanks to all of our artists today. All right. Any other thing you want to discuss with the audience, Griff? Not really. All right. Well, you want to say so long to everybody? Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Okay, I want to say thanks for coming back and listening to episode two of season three. I hope you're as excited as I am about A Wrinkle in Time. We'll be talking about lots of different books this season, of course, but A Wrinkle in Time is going to be kind of the framework for the season. I want to say thanks to our artists and our jokesters, and I want to say thanks to Eli, who's from Michigan, who's five and a half years old, who sent in a sound for Griffin Sound Club, and that was the sound when the egg was vibrating. That was Eli's sound, so thank you so much, Eli, for that. I want to take a moment to talk to the adults for a second. We've been approached as a show by a few sponsors interested in having some sort of sponsorship relationship with the show. So we're going to experiment with it a little bit. We've set up some ground rules, such as we're not going to be pitching directly to kids, and we're not going to be doing ads in the middle of the show to kind of a PBS model of uh, support at the beginning and end of the of the show. Uh, I'm very curious to hear your feedback on this decision. Should be happening in the next few weeks. Uh, if you have any thoughts or ideas or questions or concerns, I would love to hear, like I said, as an experiment to try to help support the show a little bit and keep it free for everybody. So let me know what you think about that. The Alien Adventures of Finn Caspian is a Gen Z kids production written and produced by Jonathan Messenger, edited and guided by Griffin Messenger with special thanks to Maria Villanueva. The theme music you hear at the beginning and end of every show is by Mark Greenberg, recently voted the nicest human in the known cosmos. The cover art is by Sir Ian Dingman. And if I could ask you for one favor, please tell a friend about the show. If you like it, let a friend know and hopefully they will like it as well. Thanks again, and we will see you next week. And stay tuned for the first concert by the Jonatrons. <laughs>